morning. Um, thanks, Greg. That was a great lesson. Um, and I think I might end up talking about some similar things at uh, the end of what I wanted to share. So uh, what I wanted to share today was actually kind of two separate things, but maybe the Lord will help weave them together. I don't know. But um, I thought to finish reading Matthew chapter 5. I didn't have as much to share on the remainder, but I thought it'd be good just to complete that section because I feel like the Lord wants us to to learn from him through that and give us guidance for our lives through that. So I thought it'd be good to finish that. And then I was going to read a bit more into Matthew chapter 6 uh, that I was looking at this week. So when I finished last week, it was in about verse 34, Matthew 5, verse 34. And it says, but I say to you, oh no, verse 33. Again, you have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. But I say to you, make no oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is the footstool of his feet, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shall you make an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair black, white or black. But, sit, but let your statement be, yes, yes, or no, no. Anything beyond these is, a, is of evil. And I, I alluded to it last week, but I think this section can kind of seem like, how does this even apply to us? Like the other ones just seem so applicable about anger and lust and other things. But this one can seem a little less applicable. But I think there is, I think there is some things that can still speak to us through it. I think... There is some context that could be helpful here. And if you turn to Matthew, where is it? Matthew chapter 16, or sorry, 23, Matthew chapter 23. In verse um, 16. By the temple, that is nothing. But whoever swears by the gold of the temple is obligated. You fools and blind men, which is more important, the gold or the temple that sanctified the gold? And whoever swears by the altar, that is nothing. But whoever swears by the offering on it, he is obligated. You blind men, which is more important, the offering or the altar that sanctifies the offering? And then it goes on to talk about, uh, therefore whoever swears by the altar swears both by the altar and everything on it, And whoever swears by the temple swears by both the temple and by him who dwells in it. And whoever swears by heaven swears by both the throne of God and him who sits upon it. And I think there's a couple things here. The first is, I think we can tell from these verses that the Pharisees were teaching that if you swear by one thing, like the temple, you're not actually obligated to keep your word. Like, there's a bit of a loophole there. Like, maybe, maybe... Uh, maybe, I don't know, in, in, maybe in, in modern language you, you had a contract or something for a business or whatever and, and you both totally thought that you were going to pay somebody but then you say, well, actually, no, right here it says I don't have to pay you and you kind of trick somebody or whatever. And I think that's a little bit what, what was going on here is that you could swear by the temple and then you could be uh, let go, you go to the Pharisees and say, oh, no, he didn't swear by the gold, he swore just by the temple, you're not obligated. But if you swear by the gold, then, wow, then you better keep your word, and then you better be honest. And the crux of it is, people were being deceitful. Their word was not something that could be trusted. You had to sort of look into the details of whether they sweared by the temple or the gold to understand whether they were really going to keep their word. And then I think the second thing that this is talking about is just a misunderstanding and a pride in thinking that somehow... We can swear by these holy things and call them into account for uh, some actions that we're going to commit to or be responsible for. And there's just a, there's a real lack of a fear of God in that, saying that I'll, like, to literally swear, say I'll swear by the temple, it's saying you're swearing by God. You're literally saying, like, that, that God, is, God, is, God is testifying to me, God is testifying to this as well, that I'm going to do what I'm saying. And the issue is not our intent. The issue is not the intent to do what we're saying. The issue is the lack of wisdom and fear of God to sort of call God to be our witness. We're to be his witnesses. He's not to come and bear witness to our vows and our commitments. Jesus says, rather, just say yes. And if you say yes, 
keep your word. And if you say no, mean it and keep your word. That's what Jesus says. He wants us as believers and as his disciples to have a testimony that when we say something, we mean it. And if we make a commitment, we're going to follow through with it. And even if there's some, maybe some wrinkle or some loophole where maybe we could get out of it or wiggle our way out of it, but we both knew. We both knew what we meant when we made the, well, the person I committed to knew what I meant when I said it. We don't take that loophole. We say, you know what? I said I was going to do this. I made this commitment, and I'm going to follow through with it. I think that's the testimony that Jesus is looking for here in believers, that there is a, I mean, I just, I remember there's even an old saying, and it's, it's kind of worldly, right? But there's sayings about certain people that, like, his handshake was his bond or whatever, right? Like, basically, if this, if this person shook your hand and said, it's a deal, it's done, it was done. Like, there was no going back on that. And I think that's what Jesus is talking about here, is saying that those who are his disciples, their yes is to be yes, and their no is to be no. And it's interesting how this follows right after the section on marriage, right? Because it's, it's again, I think there was, I am bearing witness and not, God's not bearing witness to me. I'm bearing witness to God. I, my life is to reflect the life that God wants to see from his children in this world. And therefore, I'm going to reflect that by my word being my bond. I want to just read a couple verses about this too. One of them is in Psalm chapter 15. And this may seem a little confusing because it uses the word vow, which Jesus is telling us uh, as, as his children, we no longer need to, 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 uh, to, to, to make our commitments in that way. But I think if you read and just follow me with this, you'll see what this is actually talking about is, is right in the same spirit of what I'm saying. So it's talking in Psalm chapter 15 about who may abide in the hill of the Lord and in the tent of the Lord. And in verse 4 it says, In whose eyes a reprobate is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord. He swears to his own hurt and does not change. What does that mean? He swears to his own hurt and does not change. I don't think it means that I, 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 like, I take a vow that says I'm going to hurt myself. What it means is you're taking and making a commitment, and even when it hurts, even when it's difficult, even when it's painful, you don't change. You follow through with it. That this, Even in the Old Covenant, there was a testimony that those are the ones who would dwell on the hill of the Lord. Those who make a commitment, and even when it hurts, they follow through with it. And I think one last thing to... I think many would know this story, because I'm not going to read it all, because it's, it's kind of an odd story. But if you read it in Judges chapter 11, there's a man named Jephthah. And he calls upon the Lord to help Israel fight this battle. And he says, it says, and he says a stupid vow. It was a dumb vow. And the Bible, I'm not making, that's not my opinion. The scripture says it was a foolish vow. But he makes a vow that whatever comes out of the door of his house, if God gives him the victory, whatever comes out of the door of his house, when he gets home, he's going to sacrifice it to the Lord. And it's like a crazy story because like one of his children comes out of the door to the house and it's just like, it's just messed up. But the reason I believe that story is in scripture is because he kept his vow. And it's just like, man, that's just terrible. But, and God hates, like there's many verses about what God thinks about what happened there and, and children being hurt by their parents. But the, the core of the story, I believe that's in scripture to give us some context on how God considers our commitment and our word, and in this case, taking a vow. Because the scripture says he was foolish in what he says. The scripture does not condemn him for what he did in following through and the fear of God he had to carry through with his vow. And like I said, it's not a, it's not a particularly encouraging story, but I think it's allowed to be in scripture for that testimony of someone who paid an ultimate commitment to keep his word to not back out you could have thought of a million reasons why and different ways to maybe try and wiggle out of that but he he took a vow he made a commitment and he followed through and i think we can use that to help us have a bit of a fear of god that says when i give my word when i make a commitment in this life 
God's intent is that I keep it and that I follow through and that my yes is my yes and my no is no. And there's probably more to even understand this because if you go and read in James, I'm not going to go there, but if you go and read in James, again, he says, like, people do not swear. Like, he actually says above all, and I'll, I'll confess, I don't exactly understand why James put such an emphasis on it, but there is something here about believers being those who you can trust and it can be rock solid, that that would be a testimony of disciples of Jesus Christ, that their word is rock solid, and that they will keep it, even if it's to their hurt. Verse 38, it says, But you have heard that it was said, An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Whoever forces you to go with him one mile, go with him two. And give to him who asks of you, and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that was, it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors and the sinners do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, you are to be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect." And I think, again, as you read through these verses, you can see the incredibly high standard, high calling it is to be a son of God. I think we can take these verses with some context elsewhere in Scripture. It's not like we as believers have to seek out or knowingly walk into situations where we're going to be wronged. It doesn't say that. Even Paul warns, I believe it's Timothy in one of his letters, like, beware of Alexander the coppersmith. He did me much harm. Like, he warns Timothy, like, be on guard. Like, this guy is against us. And so don't just, don't just be an ignorant person and walk in and let yourself be plundered and robbed by Alexander the coppersmith because he wants to destroy the gospel and the churches. So we don't have to be... It says we can be as... Uh, as shrewd as serpents, but as innocent as doves. So it's not, these verses are not to say that you just have to see a situation coming where you might get plundered or harmed or, or robbed and just walk right into it and say, well, the scripture here says i got to do this. But what it is saying is when God allows it. Because we know that everything that comes to us has to go through a filter. It has to go through a filter in God's hands that said, this will be for my child's good. Because that's the promise we have, that everything that God allows to come to his children, if we are a child of God, we have, there's a filter it has to go through that says this will be for the good of my child. And so then if we say that this is, if we take that and layer it onto here and says, okay, if God allows it to come, that an evil person comes and is allowed to do me some harm, to slap me on the face, to take something from me financially, to make me do some service to him that I really don't want to do. If God allows this to happen, then those who are his children are to have the attitude, not eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, which was the old covenant. But in the new covenant, it is we are to be those who love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. So that's the calling here, that when God allows it, when when we can stand here and say, God, I didn't go seeking this, This is not something I was looking for, but your hand has allowed it. I'm not going to resist it. I'm not going to fight against this. I mean, you could even knit some of this together, right? Like where it says that we're not to be, we're not, we started talking about anger at the beginning, right? Like you would have ample reason in these situations to feel justified in anger. Somebody came and slapped you on the face. You, would feel, you could feel very justified in being angry at that person at the injustice of what had just happened. But it says, if we're to be sons of our Heavenly Father, our response is rather that we are to love those who treat us this way. We are to love those who do evil to us. 
And it's a high calling. It's a high calling, especially when you're in that situation where somebody has hurt you or done you wrong. But I think some of the core or some of the some of the secret to unlocking this is to mix this with faith in knowing that it came and my Heavenly Father allowed it. You have to mix those two together. If, it just, if this was just a law, some sort of legalism, we're going to fail. Like We have no hope of actually walking this out. But if we do mix it with the promise that my Heavenly Father who loves me has allowed this, and in his perfect wisdom he knows that he wants to use this for good in my life, then we can have that hope. And I'm not going to say it's easy. I know of certain situations even right now where I'm just like, man, this is, this is a tough situation. Like I, not me personally, but I'm just like, this is hard. Like if I was in this situation, it, I understand why it's a battle. I understand why there's like weeping and asking the Lord, help me. Cause I, I don't know how to love this person, Lord. I don't know how to forgive. I don't know how to do this. But in that, our heavenly father, a little bit like I shared last week, some of these verses and some of the things that was on my heart is that we would have the burden. We would have the burden from God to see things the way he sees it and have the burden to want to actually live in the way he's calling us. And even if it seems completely beyond ourselves to actually walk it out, to not to be angry, not to lust, to keep our vows, in this case, to love our enemies. These scriptures are here to give us the burden to live God's way. I was encouraged this morning, just that song that Marie asked for, the line that was encouraging me was the line about falling before his throne. And that reminds me of the verse in Hebrews, right? Like, come boldly to the throne of grace for help in time of need. If we take these scriptures and if we believe them and say, God, these scriptures are true. This instruction is not some calling that we're not intended to fulfill or some, I've heard lots of, I'll call them stupid arguments that say somehow Matthew 5 is not for us. It's some, there's ways that people write it off and say it's not for, not for Christians or it's somehow under the law or some other things that are just wrong. And people say that because the standard is so high. But rather, these things are intended to make us needy and make us understand how God wants us to live so that we come to him for the grace to help. Because of ourselves, of ourselves, this is impossible. Of ourselves, there is no way to fulfill this. But by God's grace, and I was thinking about it the other day, like, you, you could actually read the law sometimes and see, like, do not, thou shalt, thou, you could almost read that list and think, I maybe could do that. Maybe I could pull that off. Like, maybe I in my willpower could actually live according to some of that Ten Commandments. But we have to remember the testimony of Scripture. That every single man, woman, child failed. Failed that standard. That that standard, even that standard given in the law, no man could keep. God looked to try and find one, and he found none. It says that in the Psalms. And yet, what does Jesus Christ bring in these testimonies? A testimony that says the law was here, but I actually want my disciples to live up here. The law says, do not murder, but I say, don't be angry. Jesus raised a standard beyond what was already there in the law, or else at least gave the full clarity to what God wanted in that. Knowing that people couldn't keep it, but also knowing that he was going to die and he was going to send the helper, the Holy Spirit, to help his disciples live this life, to live this testimony and be able to keep these instructions. That when they see this and when they know that someone is treating them wrong and someone is literally being your enemy, somebody is against you, trying to hurt you, to be able to come to a place where you can love that person by the grace of God and to come to the place where you see this calling and it brings you to the place where you are falling before the throne of God saying, God, I need grace. I need help. Of myself, I cannot overcome lust. Of myself, I cannot overcome anger. I need your grace. Help me, Father, please. And you do it in faith, and we know that he will do it. We know that he will do it. It may take time. We don't know how the path is going to go, but we know for certain that he will do it. That is his promise, that he will make it happen, that his grace will be sufficient to help us in every situation he allows.
So that was what I had to share on Matthew 5. But if we jump to Matthew chapter 6, I had a few more things I wanted to share out of there. Starting in Matthew 6, verse 19. It says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And I can say that the most important part of this to me and I'm not saying it's all there is in here, but what spoke to my heart was just that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And I think it's both a promise and a warning. Because you can do a lot of things and try and live a life here that has a lot of religious or good things going, certain principles you may live by and certain morals you may hold to, But the promise and the warning here is that unless our treasure is in heaven, our heart is not going to be there. You can do a lot of right things, but if our treasure is here on earth, our heart is going to be tied to this earth, tied to this world. And as I read it, that was just in my, just kind of the burden I had is that, Lord, I want my treasure to be in heaven. I do not want my treasure to be down here on earth and I think like I said if we take that seriously we can then look and see well what is this what does this mean to have our treasure in heaven how do we store up treasures in heaven well there's a few examples and a few things I'll share on top of that one of is in Matthew 19 verse 21 This is a rich young ruler who comes to Jesus who had much wealth. And it's actually kind of like the story I just shared a little bit because he did a lot of good things. He's like, Jesus gave him some instruction and he said, I've done all these things. I haven't stolen. I haven't committed adultery. I haven't borne false witness. I've honored my father and mother. I've even loved my neighbor as myself. The rich young ruler said in the or rich young man said in this verse 20, all these things I've done, what more am I still lacking? Jesus said to him, If you wish to be complete, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. So the problem here was, despite living a very moral life, this man's focus, this man's treasure was here on earth, and I've heard a good example of this before, that Jesus doesn't like, this is not a command that says, okay, now everyone go and sell everything you have and give it to the poor. But it is the example I heard, which was good, that the love of money and having our treasure in this earth is like a cancer. It's like a cancer. In some cases, you can maybe cut a cancer out and and do a surgery and and, and have it removed and, and you can heal and become better. And in other cases, there just ha- may have to be a full removal of an organ or, or other places where the cancer exists. And in this case, for this man, the cancer was deep. This love of money was deep. And so Jesus said, you need to sell everything. You need to sell everything or else it's not going to work for you. Because this love of money, this love of the treasures on this earth is so deep in you that I I don't see any other way other than for you to sell everything and follow me and thereby store up treasures in heaven. But the warning for any of us is that even if we don't hear that instruction from Jesus to sell everything and give to the poor, what we do know is that willingness to part with our wealth here in support of the areas and in, in the ways that Jesus commands us, instructs us, That is one way that we can store up treasure in heaven. That is one way that we can uh, ensure and work towards having our 
hearts not tied to this earth, tied to this world and having our treasure where God wants it to be. And if you go back to Matthew chapter 6, it says, the eye is the lamp of the body. So then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you in dar- is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. And I think the warning here, particularly verse 23, is about being in that place where you think you think you have light. You think your eye is 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 perceiving God's way, and you think that the light of God is shining into you, and you're following him, and you understand, and you're actually doing well, and that you're being a disciple. And Jesus is warning, like, and it's interesting, he gives this warning about wealth, because I think it can be so deceptive and so tricky that you can think you're actually living for storing treasures in heaven and living with heaven as the priority but you can actually still be living completely and utterly for this world and i when i read this i go even further and i hope it's okay i go a little further than just saying money it's like ultimately at its core it's about living for ourselves it's about living for our desire, for our, because ultimately what is, you can say, for even, like for myself, I can say, I don't love money. I could maybe say that it, it doesn't pull that hard on me. I can, I like, I'm just going to speak personally here. Like some people I see, they have a, like they're very focused on, on their money and their bank account and they know where every penny's going. And in some cases that's really good. They're very disciplined. You can see, oh, that person is really focused on, on, on their money, and man, I, I hope they don't love it. I mean, it's good to be good to be disciplined and have a good tight budget, and they don't love it. But I, I, I can look at that and compare myself to that and say, well, I, I'm not like that. I don't, I don't spend all my time thinking about the money, and, and, and therefore I, I mustn't love money. But I think another way to look is just to reflect on how we live. And I think for me personally, I'm just going to share some personal things, like... God has spoken to me and said, well, you, you say you don't love money, but, like, look how you dress. And I'm not saying that because I have a deep conviction to change that, but, I, like, let's just, let's just pause for a second here, Joel, and let's say, yeah, you don't love money, but you may be perfectly willing to spend, like, three or four times what somebody else would pay for something just because you like a certain thing. And, like, you say you don't love money, Joel, but let's, 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 just, let's just be cautious here that just because you're not worried about it or you can see something in someone else at how they live and that can say oh that that's danger they're maybe in danger of loving money or loving wealth well let's just look at you joel and how you live and where areas where you may get a little caught up a little bit of in danger of having this treasure on earth and i share that personal example not mainly just because i i I hope it can be clear like i just for me it's when it talks about loving money, it's it's talking about loving money, loving the things it can buy, loving comfort, loving all that it provides to us in this earth. And I'm not endorsing a legalism. I, I can tell you, when I first came to the Lord, I knew, I knew that clothing was an uh, area of temptation for me. And actually what I did, and I don't say this to boast because it didn't help. I actually went to my closet and I emptied it out. I had a suit jacket somebody had given me that was a thousand bucks. I literally took it and took it to MCC in Vancouver. I said, I got to get this out. I don't want to love clothes. I don't want to love money. I got to get this stuff out of my closet. And I can tell you, unfortunately, it didn't remove it from my heart. That's a work of grace. But it is a warning about where we want our treasure to be. And I say that not to, not to boast that or say that because it, it didn't work. It wasn't, it wasn't a good decision. It actually offended the person who gave me the jacket. It was a kind of a dumb decision. But the reality is that it's not just about having a big salary or having lots of money stored up. Because I'm going to read another verse about this. But the warning is about having our treasure here. The warning is about all the things that that can encompass. 
And I don't want people to walk away from this in bondage, but I do want our hearts to be maybe softened and quickened to this because all that it encompasses, that can be uh, I, vacations, cars, whatever, like all these different things that God gives us and uh, he gives them to us to richly enjoy. But the, the, what we need to be on guard against is allowing this to somehow cloud our eye, that somehow we cling and hold on to things, that this is where our satisfaction and our joy in this life is from. Because we don't want that. We, we don't, the warning is, and I think, I'll stop giving examples because the Holy Spirit needs to speak to each of our hearts. But the warning is that that is where our treasure is. The warning is, don't let that be your treasure. Let your treasure be in heaven. Because wherever your treasure is, like I said, that's where your heart is going to be. You can't change that. That's a law of God. That if our treasure is here, your heart is here. And if your treasure is in heaven, then praise God. That is where our heart will be also. And that's the warning to us. And that's how we want to... That's how we want to take heed and take warning from this passage. But I think I'll read just a couple more verses to help give some, some, some balance. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6. <laughs> I believe it's earlier in the book of 1 Timothy where Paul actually says that the love of money is the root of all evil. Somebody can help me with that. I think he says that earlier in the book. So he's certainly warning about the dangers of money. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So let's read verse uh, chapter 6, verse 9 and 10, and then I'm going to read what I meant to read at the end. So it says, but those who want to get rich. I think that's an important context. Those who want to get rich. Or I would say... One step further, those who want the comfort that this world offers. You may not say, I want to get rich. You may say, well, I can easily say that's not me. I don't, I'm not trying to become a billionaire or something. But it's those who want that comfort. Those who want all that those riches entail. All that that offers us. That temptation. That was one of the things that the devil tempted Jesus with. All that we want, they fall into a snare. And many and foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, or you could even translate that, the root of all evil. And some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. I don't know. I'll share a quick testimony. I'm not going to say the name, but I read a biography one time of a man who was a young man, and he had a horrible upbringing. His dad was just a complete scoundrel and living in poverty. And one of the points in his life that was a real transition was he ended up in a church where there were some genuine believers who planted a faith in him that, that really brought in out like there was some real change some real principles that that governed his life but and you could like some of the things like this man like it was a time of uh, time when there was slavery and there was those who were working to help slaves get free and it was actually kind of a there definitely was certain elements of the church at that time and I personally believe it was genuine from God the the Quakers and some of the Baptists and stuff were actually helping slaves get free escape these horrible horrible bondages that that men and slave slave owners were putting them into and it's not like I know Paul says if you're a slave stay a slave but these are situations of like murder and children being stripped like just horrible stuff and so they're allowing for situations for some of these slaves to get free and this, this man, he was actually like, yeah, like he had a burden. Like, I want to help the poor. I want to help slaves get free. And he was supporting some of these things. And another thing, he was like zero, like different things, like no alcohol. It was people being destroyed. He saw it in his own family. I'm like, we're never going to touch that. He had all these good principles and morals. But I can tell you, this man went on to become the richest man in the world. Period. He was the richest man in the world. The end of the story, he lost his family. His children ended up in horrible destructions they became caught up in all kinds of like just crazy immoral garbage and even him himself at the end of his life you, i wouldn't i'm not even gonna tell you a testimony or the book but it's like it's not good like it's it's really like 
questionable where the story ends for him. And it's just an example. When I read about him being plagued and plunged through with many griefs, like, I don't know where his heart was at. I can tell you if my heart was, like if my children were living the way his children were living, I would be like, God, take every penny to turn them from it. Take every penny to pull them out of these friendships and these relationships and these adulteries. Like, do whatever it takes, God. Get them out. But your money cannot buy that. Your money is useless for that. And he was plunged through with many griefs. He became the richest man in the world, but he lost his family. And I can say from the testimony I saw, I don't know how it ended for him. But then the verse I wanted to read was in verse 17. Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to become conceited or fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. So I think this is a good balance. This is very healthy from the scripture to see, okay, you know what? We've got, a situ- we got the warning about the deception that there's two masters in this world. There's God and there's wealth, and we don't want to be deceived. We want to have our hearts sensitive and we want to store up treasures in heaven. But it's also saying that not all are going to be called, like the rich young ruler, to sell everything and give it to the poor. But rather the instruction to those who are rich is not to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches. Don't let that be your treasure because it can be gone tomorrow. Sorry, I'm thinking of another example, but uh, maybe for the sake of time, I won't share it. But it can be gone tomorrow. Actually, I'm going to share it. There's a man named Charles Finney. I think many of you would have heard of him. And he was a revivalist that God used to bring about mighty changes in uh, America and, and just bring people to deep repentance from their sin. And he's used broadly in America for a period of time. And he went and stayed in one city he went and stayed in. He stayed at the home, home of a wealthy man. This, had a, this man had a very prosperous business to the point like he was able to fund, or actually I don't think it ended up happening, but he had enough money to fund like building him an entire university. Like He was a very wealthy man. And Charles Finney stayed at his home. And Charles Finney testified that he was always kind of surprised that this guy could walk straight out of the business day and then come into a prayer meeting or different involvements in church matters and in the work of God. And it Finney could see him just flow like almost seamlessly, like straight from the business right into this prayer meeting and, and could tell that the man had his mind on heaven and had a renewed mind and a renewed heart and was able to immediately kind of uh, partake and be a blessing in these meetings. And Finney was kind of surprised at that just because he'd seen the common pattern of those who were wealthy and those who were businessmen and how it can sometimes damage their spiritual walk. But then Finney said, well, he was staying at his house one time It all of a sudden became clear to him why this was, why this man had this testimony. He said he got up in the middle of the night one time to go deal with something, and he went past the man's office, and he noticed the man's light was on. And so he's like, just sort of popped his head in and said, hey, like, what's going on? Is everything okay? And I was like, oh, oh, yeah, it's it's fine. I'm I'm good. He's like, well, what's going on here? The man said, well, you know what? My life is so busy. This, the businesses and all this stuff is so busy. He said, so for years now, I wake up in the middle of the night and I take that time. I'll spend a couple hours down here with the Lord. I just come downstairs and I'll just focus on him and read his word and speak to him and he speaks to me. And this is how, this is how God has taught me that I can stay close to him. And I just read that. I was like, wow, okay, there's a rich man who has this world's riches, but his treasure is not here. His treasure is not this world. But how many have that testimony? I don't know. But that was the testimony of a man who actually had come to a place where his, his treasure and his riches were not here. And he had that, but God, he had learned and found a way that he was to walk with God and that God had instructed him and shown him how to, how to walk this path that he had entrusted him to. And I can tell you the reason that came to mind because it says the uncertainty of riches. 
that man later, there was a crash, and he actually lost everything. He was going to fund the university, and he didn't end up being able to do it. But the testimony doesn't say that, uh, I don't actually know what happened to him, but from his testimony, I don't believe that uh, that would have caused him to turn away from the Lord, because we know that if you're living that way, he had the testimony that his hope was not here. His hope was in heaven, and he made it his priority amongst all his life. He found time, and he found a way to make God his priority, and he had a testimony that he was a blessing, not because of his money, but because he knew God. And he spent time with God. And he was able to be a blessing because of that, not because of his wealth. But just to wrap up, I think we see here in these scriptures that this is the calling of God. That those who are rich in this world should not trust in those riches, not be proud, but rather be generous and full of good works and ready to serve. Just to wrap up, I think the last thing I wanted to share, and I'm not going to get to it. I said I was maybe going to talk on what Greg talked on, but if you read the very next section after this, it talks about being free from worry and free from anxiety. And I think there's a correlation there between the love of money and the, and, and the cares of this world and being free from those and how that's how God wants us to live in both money and many other matters in our health. It talked about that right in that section about who can add a day to their life an hour to their life by worrying that we need to be able to trust our heavenly father with all these things but i think some of it comes from the fact that maybe if we have these anxieties we have these worries maybe it is speaking to us a little bit about where our treasure is and where our heart is and we can we can be warned by that it's also speaking about faith and trust but last thing is in asking how do i store up treasures in heaven how do we store up treasures in heaven jesus said sell your possessions, give to the poor. And there's other testimonies of that, that one of the ways that we store up treasure in heaven is by giving to those who are in need. And I can tell you that and most importantly, because we see it in the testimony of the Acts and in, this, and in the letters from Paul, that it's in particular giving to the brothers and sisters who are in need. That is how we can store up treasures in heaven. But I think it's even broader than that. If you turn to Matthew chapter 25, It talks about the judgment, and it talks about it in, in verse 34, talking about the judgment of the righteous, the sheep and the goats. It says, For the king will come to those on his right and say, Come you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you, a stranger, invited you in, naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to the least, to one of the least of these, to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. And I think for me, that is the, that, like, that is storing up treasures in heaven. When we have our heart that says, you know what, God, I want to have my focus on how do I minister to you, Jesus? How do I look after you? How do I look after you, which is your body? The least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. And I just was like, that's, that is storing up treasures in heaven. When our focus when our focus, like, is it can be a bit of a, like, tough thing to co- concept to grasp. Like, how do I store up treasures in heaven? Like, how do I even, how, is that a mental thing? Well, I think that storing up treasures in heaven is a having a focus on Christ and a focus on his body. That when we are, when our focus is the building of Christ's kingdom, when our focus is the building of his church, and all the ways that that can look, and all the ways that we can be, led of the Lord to build and, and, and to contribute and to give of ourselves towards that, that is storing up treasures in heaven. That is allowing our heart to share the same burden that God has, to see his kingdom built, to see his church built up, to see his church become a glorious testimony. Then we can have some guidance as to how we might go about storing up treasures in heaven, how we might 
allow our hearts to to be to be instructed and to be taught how to build